You're watching Drake Wing Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. It's of you, man. It's the gaming dragon. Today I'm coming back at you with the Let's Play episode of In Case of Emergency, Wes's Path. So y'all, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right back into it, shall we? Alarm Chan, you are up and let's go. All right. <clears throat> And it's lunch, and the dining room is again, is again as though as though by magic, stocked with steaming loaves of bread and carved meats. And you're a freshman all over again, trying to figure out how not to gorge yourself on the vast variety of food readily available to you all at once. You learn quickly, though, because soon after lunch is Cedric's turn to pull you aside and correct everything you've learned that morning. But, but Wes said, and he hasn't had the training I've had. Your training goes relatively smoothly. Fortunately, you're still new enough to still new enough to the task that small accomplishments translate to major relative improvements in skill. Being part of a prophecy probably helps, though you're still not sure exactly what's expected of you. Without any formal obligations, it's easy enough to waste your afternoons aimlessly wandering the halls of the castle. It's quieter than you initially realize, with most of the hustle and bustle confined to areas around the central hall. The farther you get from the castle's heart, the stranger the rooms get. One door leads you to a room of, of room of clocks, old, dusty grandfather clocks with enormous pendulums, intricate wall-mounted ones wrapped in metal vines, and small, stout ones meant to be set on a desk, with hands that remind you of a handlebar mustache and seem liable to come, come to life and break into song. All the clocks are broken, frozen at different points in time. If a broken clock is right twice a day, maybe a whole room of them could be right that many more times. Another room features bathtubs stacked on top of one another, and yet another appears to be an abandoned planetarium, except instead of planets revolving around a sun, the, car the colorful glass orbs spin around a larger-than-life skeleton curled in the fetal position. And down a long, quiet hallway and behind a pale green door appears to be a small church, pews on either side of a moth-eaten carpet that leads to, uh, to, a, that leads to a lonely, dust-covered pulpit. A leather-bound book rests on its surface. Pick up the book. Your hand reaches around the book, a fine layer of dust falling off of it as you disturb it. It leaves behind a clean rectangle of wood in the dust. The words of for a funeral liturgy. Remus stands at the door with a placid expression, as though he's commenting on what's for dinner. What does it say? It's a prayer for the passage of the dead. We haven't had cause to use it in a while. He didn't realize there was death in this world, which, in retrospect, seems foolish. Of course there would be death in every world. That's grim. That's dark. Hopefully we can avoid using it for a bit longer, if we are successful in our quest. Though I suppose it won't matter if we fail. Have you ever lost anyone? The question takes you by surprise. Yes. I lost my dad recently. Remus nods. My parents were led to believe they had lost me early on. Former king and queen? No, actually, they were academics. Obsessed with the ancient world. He cocks his head, lost in thought for a moment. Loss is difficult. It changes us. Changes the world around us. But no one has ever really gone. When someone leaves this existence, they also leave their absence behind. Like a footprint left in drying cement, or a name carved into a tree. You're not entirely sure sh you're not sure your dad left anything of the sort behind, except maybe the weird anxious feeling you get when you try not to think of him. But maybe that's what he's talking about. We tell the world someone was here, through the through this violence. To carve something out of this world is just as much to carve meaning into it. What will you leave behind when you are gone? The atmosphere of the church lends a certain gravity to his words. If nothing else, it's comforting to hear someone else fill the silence. Remus leads you out of the room, leaving the book behind in its place on the pulpit. Maybe another time. He has other duties to attend to that day, but on others, you spot the, spot the king in the garden, enjoying a pot of tea under the gazebo. When he sees you, he waves you over with a pleasant smile. It becomes part of your routine, your homework, and other responsibilities long forgotten amongst the sweet smell of roses. A new path becomes added to your day. The walk, through the, the walk through the stones and laid in the garden dirt, winding through the fragrant thickets of roses, dahlias, and lavender, past the vine-covered trellis and into the st cool stone halls of the castle. Then it's dinner, or talk about plants, and the climb back home. No, no nighttime return is as eventful as your first. Being thrown back into your body becomes less shocking and more depressing. You can't help but feel sorry for the person you're leaving behind. He has no idea how great his life actually is, locked out of real happiness. Or is it the reality of his happiness, by pure ignorance? You sleep better than he ever would. You imagine that's your consolation gift to him, a trickle-down happiness from the fortunate to the less. A week passes quickly a week passes quickly this way. You wake. Head out the door with a smile on your face. And with anticipation pounding in your ears. Kieran! Oh, one second now. Water time.
Okay. Professor Abbott stands in front of his office door, a stack of papers tucked under his arm. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. I'll have your reference letter for you in class today. Oh, right, you've forgotten about that. You haven't thought about getting a job in a long time, at least a week. Thank you, I appreciate it. You nod and start shuffling away, signaling that you're ready to leave the conversation. You don't have time for this. You're about to embark on a real journey. Are you trying to leave? You freeze in your tracks. What? No, why would you? He shakes his head and points to the emergency exit before you. That exit is locked. You'll want to leave through the front door. Right, of course. Kieran. This guy will not leave this conversation. Be careful. I read the newspaper that it would be exceptionally hot today. Stay indoors. Right, that won't matter much for you. I will, Professor. Thanks. Your legs are itching to race down the staircase, but you force yourself to wait until you hear the sound of Professor Abbott's door clicking shut. Downstairs, the castle is bustling with activity, staff moving to and fro across the waxed floors balancing various provisions in their arms. You make your way to the dining room, following the smell of freshly baked brioche, when someone pulls you aside and ushers you to, the, ushers you to one of the castle's many side rooms. A troop of servants are waiting for you, each holding a particular garment that, you fitted, that you've been fitted for over the course of the week. They make stilted bows towards you before asking permission to dress you. A week of dealing with straps and buckles has taught you to put aside your pride. Sure, thanks. With your permission, you're just dis you're descended upon like a swarm. You're descended upon like a swarm upon a carcass. Limbs lifted and stuffed into your leather raiments. Straps tightened and belts cinched. It reminds you of being dressed for kindergarten by your mother. Whatever happened to that sailor outfit? Boots are slid snugly onto your around around onto your feet. The hardened material soft and supple against your toes. A braided belt is pulled taut against your around your waist over layers of linen and toughened hide. There's a leather loop tied to it that you assume your sword, THE sword, fits into. You barely recognize your reflection in the humble mirror leaning against the stone wall. It's both what you expected and nothing at all like it. For one, you don't look like a corny kid in bedsheets with a foam sword. But you also don't look like the grizzled handsome men on TV, their faces shiny with grime, sweat, and blood. So it's not cool, but it does feel real, which is an unexpected development amidst all this. You're looking at the magic of fairy tales. Not flesh to bone, but rags to dresses, mice to coachmen, and frogs to princes. You can't help but check yourself out a little. There's a knock at the door. Wes enters the room and shuts the door behind him. Hey, looking good. So do you. You look good too. Wes looks you up and down appraisingly, his eyes lingering a little too long to plead innocent to only platonic interest. You adjust the hem of your shirt, feeling your face go warm. Ready to go? Yeah, I got my wallet, my sword, and a sack of, and a sack lunch with a bottle of water. Wes chuckles and shakes his head. It's been a long while since we've gone on a quest. It's good to be prepared. Is it going to be dangerous? Whatever dangers might be on the road, the grin, the grin, the grin Wes flashes at you feels infinitely more deadly. Why? Scared? Don't worry. I'll protect you. God, he's hot when he does that dumb macho confident thing. You unsuccessfully try to stop the stupid smile that's spreading across your face. Your cheeks are going to ache if you keep keep if you keep this up. I'm looking forward to letting to getting away from real life for a bit. Thank God I won't have to do any of those essays I haven't been doing. Me too. Apparently I'm throwing another party this week. I think the excuse this time is my younger brother's new drawings. What? Like your parents stuck them on the refrigerator? West laughs, his mouth open revealing rows of sharp teeth. More like a national museum stuck them in their na in their new modern art ex exhibition. Did you say this was your younger brother? He's 17. He sold his first painting while I was still working on my college applications. Then he dropped out of high school, and now he's in museums and theaters around the country. Second like, no, water time. It's hard to picture anyone related to Wes quitting school to pursue the visual performing arts. You're imagining a family of cutthroat businessmen and lawyers doing lines, of, lines off of strippers on yachts, whatever it is rich men do. I didn't think there'd be artists in your family. Wes shrugs. It's probably for my mother. She's an architect. I don't know where my older brother got his thing from. I don't think he's had a job. Ever. So the only reasonable person left is you. I'm starting to get a picture of how Wes fits into his family, sandwiched between two vagrant siblings unfit to inherit their family business. You don't think this is a responsibility he wants as much as it is one he feels obligated to fulfill. Unable to turn it, unable to turn it down, but unwilling to stop running from it, He's spinning in place. No wonder this place is an escape for him. Wes shivers, fluffing out the fur along his neck. Don't remind me.
The two of you make your way out of the ca out to the castle grounds, where a humble carriage awaits you. It's a smart, trim buggy. It looks like it could barely fit a few people. Magically powered! No steeds, no fuel, no motors! Very echo-friendly! Sounds great, but you're still not sure how any group other than an other than an alley of clowns could fit in here. Remus waves waves you over from both the, from by the carriage door, one foot resting on the steps. Interesting choice of armor, Luke. If anyone else has anything to say about it, they don't speak up. Cedric has a pained expression on his face, while West looks nonplussed. After you! Oh, after you. Remus clambers in first and extends a hand to you pulling you into the carriage. Whoa! The vehicle is bigger on the inside. It's a conservatively sized door giving way to a lavish train car. The soft carpet flooring depresses under your weight. The others climb in quickly after you. Cedric is the last to enter. You notice there's a new short sword hanging, from, hanging around his waist you haven't seen before, and it taps the side of the door frame as he enters. He notices you looking, and as he takes his seat, explains. I was told it was good luck. It's supposed to protect you from getting sick, poison, stuff like that. He shrugs as he runs his thumb over the golden palm of the sword, as well as it might confer on him some of that luck. The carriage begins to move on its own, lurching forward with the start before stabilizing to a more steady speed. It's really happening. The entire morning has been such a blur that you haven't had a chance to comprehend what you're getting yourself into. Remus rolls out a weathered map on the table, holding one corner flat with a pouch of coins and another with an abandoned mug. He stabs a finger at a particular point. Here will be our first challenge. We'll reach the Willow's Grove by tonight, but it would it would be in our best interest to set camp outside its borders. The Willow's Grove? What's that? A haunted forest. The trees bleed black at night, and the air smells of iron. Well, because the trees are bleeding. <laughs> oh. Then we will continue through the abandoned silver mines of... Asgruzadan. We will have to leave our carriage in the hands of the closest village, and if all goes well, we can return for it. Uh, Asgruzi what? Sorry, the minds of what? <laughs> As Grizzadan, it's a civilization that preceded ours. No one knows where they went, only that they left behind abandoned mines and ruins. Cool. And finally, we make our way. We'll make our way across the sheer torrent cliffs. The invisible bridge can only maintain one's weight while one believes in its existence. You appear closer at the map to get a better look. Each location is lovingly rendered in ink, winding rivers drawn alongside intricate forests and coastlines. Why go around the river? <clears throat> Why go around the river? We can skip all this if we just cross here. Second y'all, water time. <laughs> That's the stuff. Yep, okay. Luke puts his finger on the map and Remus shakes his head. The rapids are too dangerous this time of year. The glacier runoff makes it impossible to cross. Remus wraps a knuckle against the spread map. A proper adventure! It has been a while. The minutes pass slowly. There's no window to look out of, though you're not sure what kind of view you'd get from the warped proportions of this car. Luke pulls out a deck of cards and wraps Wes up in a card game, while Cedric and Remus pour over the map and discuss cities and rivers that you've never heard of. What's Wes doing? Card game, okay. Join Wes and Luke, who are happy to accommodate you in their game of Go Fish. By the time you've happily handily won a few rounds, Luke suggests raising the stakes with poker. He even throws down a few gold coins on the table. Wes agrees, and who are you to do anything but cave to peer pressure? In a matter of a few games, you're cleaned out. Luke has a big mouth, and unfortunately good enough luck to back it up. There were a few times Wes could have won with a better hand, but he's always well, he's always too quick to fold. As for you, well, you never had the best of luck anyways. Suddenly a sharp crack sounds from outside the carriage, and the room is sharply tilted to the right, sending tables and chairs sliding across the interior. Everyone scrambles for the opposite end, trying to get a hold on anything bolted down. The carriage begins to violently shudder and shake, bouncing up and down the unpaved dirt road. There's a rattling sound to the back axle. Sounds like we blew a wheel! Fix it! Yeah, just let me grab the spare wooden wheel in the trunk while we're still moving! Turn it off! Luke already has his hand out in, ex in concentration, muttering what you think is an incantation, except you hear under his breath... Do this, Luke! Uh, fix this, Luke! Uh, and magic basically makes you an on-call handyman, right? The carriage seems to begin to slow, the rattling grow, growing quieter, until gravity begins to teeter towards the front of the car, like a roller coaster about to go down a steep drop. Alright, y'all. I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and that notification bell. Leave a super thanks, or if you can, it always helps. 
Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.